On a chilly day in October, a mom was walking down this Chicago sidewalk while holding the hand of her three-year-old child. Lurking above them, 29 stories in the air was a precarious and ultimately deadly situation. It came from a mixture of material physics, unique architectural design, and a bad bet by the original building's owner. A dinner tray-sized shard of glass was barely clinging onto the facade of this building. The building is known as the CNA Tower. You can always spot it in the Chicago skyline because it's bright red. Rewinding time back four months, this window was greeting a summer day like any other. The glass would have been cool to the touch. The nighttime brought with it cooler temperatures outside. The window lost the heat it had acquired during the previous day, giving it off to the air around it all night. But as the June day progressed, the sun rose and crept across the sky. One of the unique features of this building, besides its color, are the deeply recessed windows of the facade. When the building won its award from the American Institute of Architects back in 1974, it was praised for its strong play of light and shadow. On the east side of the building, facing the lake, the entire facade greets the sun almost all at once. But on this side, facing south, some parts of each window are introduced to the sun before other parts of the window. This is a problem. The area of the window that is exposed to the sun absorbs the UV energy from the light rays. The area gets warmer, while the area in shadow stays the same cool temperature that it's been all night. Glass expands as it's heated, and when this happens unevenly within a single sheet, it develops internal stresses as some parts are trying to pull away from others. Eventually, the sheet of glass can no longer hold together, and it cracks. This is what happened at the CNA Tower in June. Fast forward four months to that perilous day, and a gust of wind dislodged it, sending it plummeting to the ground, killing the woman while sparing her child. While this incident is horrifically tragic, this kind of thing is actually more common than you think. Around 50 people per year are struck by falling debris from skyscrapers in New York alone. Because anything can fall from one of these buildings, and it's over from It's crazy. It's and there's nothing we can do about it. There's nothing we can do about it. Many in Chicago know the story of the Aeon Tower that was originally clad with thin sheets of marble. The relatively soft marble would crack and fall off in giant chunks. One piece fell right through the roof of the neighboring building. The owners of the Aeon Tower made the difficult decision to strip all the marble off the building and install granite in its place. Granite is harder than marble and it's less prone to cracking. The Aeon Company still won't release how much all this costs them, but most guesses are around $100 million. Last year, 31 windows failed in San Francisco alone. And in San Francisco, glass fell from a high rise and came crashing down onto the street below. This is at 555. While most of them were attributed to a month of heavy windstorms, a study revealed that nearly all of the windows had cracked before the storms even hit. The CNA example, too, sat for four months before it let go. But its problems began way before that, almost since the day that it finished construction. So, how hard is it to make sure that a window stays inside of a skyscraper? And what's supposed to happen if a problem is eventually found? We already talked about the role of the sun and differential heating within the glass. Today, that kind of deep facade of the CNA tower would likely be avoided, or a low emissive film would be applied to prevent the glass from absorbing so much heat. These films help reflect the wavelengths of sunlight that lead to it absorbing the heat in the first place, so that mitigates the differential temperatures that could cause cracks. But wind is also a factor for breaking windows and then getting blown off the building. Even in a brand new tower, a window fell off just last year from one Chicago, and it nearly killed a man during recent windstorm that saw wind speeds up to 65 miles per hour. Wind creates a lot of force, and that's mostly because the force generated by wind is applied over a broad area. The bigger the window, the greater the force that it has to resist. To calculate how much architects and engineers, they have tools like Bernoulli's equation. It formulates with a few variables that account for things like air density and wind speed to arrive at an overall force that the window experiences. So a window that is experiencing 65 mile per hour winds is experiencing about 11 pounds per square foot. So an average window getting bombarded by wind might experience about 165 pounds overall of force. But that's not usually the problem. Bernoulli also helps us to understand that when wind hits a building directly, it creates a high-pressure area on the side that the wind is hitting. You know, this is pretty intuitive because the air molecules are pushed against the building surface, creating this high-pressure zone. 
But what's not intuitive is that on the other side of the building, known as the leeward side, as well as the, along the sides of the building, the situation changes and becomes a little bit more complicated. The wind flowing around the building speeds up and spreads out, leading to reduction in pressure on these surfaces compared to the high pressure area on the windward side. This pressure difference results in a suction effect on all the windows and surfaces that aren't directly facing the wind. More of Bernoulli's equation tells us that this suction can be like three to four times the amount of the direct pressure. While every building is somewhat different and unique, here in Chicago, you might get a suction force of 70 pounds per square foot. So for a typical window at the corner of a building where the suction is the greatest, the wind might be pulling with a thousand pounds of force trying to rip it right off the building. That's the kinds of things that windows and buildings are designed to withstand here in Chicago. The American Society of Civil Engineers, or ASCE, provides guidelines through ASCE 7 called Minimum Design Loads for Buildings and Other Structures, which is the widely adopted standard. In order to best to resist these kinds of forces, architects typically spec heat strength in glass in skyscrapers. This means that the glass is reheated after forming, is heated to just below the melting point, and then it's allowed to cool relatively slowly. This means that the outer surface cools and hardens first, and this causes compressive forces inside of the glass that increase its overall strength. That's to about two times of what it would have been otherwise. Tempered glass, on the other hand, is when you accelerate the cooling process overall to create higher surface compression. And this is what you find in car windshields, for instance. Heat and pressure bring the three layers of material into a permanent union. The process creates optical distortions in the glass, though, and that is not great for a skyscraper. When the glass eventually breaks in tempered glass, it does so in tiny little pieces, which sounds much more ideal, but this makes it actually much more likely to fall out of the window system when it breaks. Another option is laminated glass, which is made up of two or more sheets of glass that are bonded together with a layer of film in between. This film is usually polyvinyl butyrol, or PVB, or ethylene vinyl acetate, or EVA. This makes the glass much stronger and less likely to shatter. If the outer layer of the glass does break, the inner layers will hold it in place, preventing it from falling and causing injury. But this has problems in skyscrapers too. Moisture can seep into the interlayer material and cause the glass to discolor and become foggy over time. And laminated glass can become warped or bowed due to temperature changes or uneven pressure during the manufacturing process. Either way, a typical window in a skyscraper these days is made up of two six millimeter or one quarter inch thick pieces of glass that are about one half of an inch apart. The glass might be thicker in certain cases for added strength overall. The glass is usually held in place with a reinforced aluminum extruded frame and then a rubbery gasket material. It holds the glass while also allowing for enough movement in the various parts of the glass and aluminum so that they don't impart any other forces upon one another. So, those are the physical forces at play. But the situation here at the CNA Tower is much more complicated than just that. The level of tragedy only comes when people are making decisions that inaccurately balance cost and risk. So, after the building is built, how its owners deal with problems and upkeep during its lifetime? Now might be a good time to mention that the owners of the building, CNA, is the seventh largest commercial insurer in the United States. It's in the business of weighing risk and cost. This is also where a lot of other set of equations begin to take over. The CNA Tower's problems began immediately after construction. About 100 windows cracked in the first year. The glass wasn't laminated or tempered. It wasn't even heat treated. But even though it didn't use the strongest glass options available, the specific causes of the cracking weren't immediately obvious. CNA sued all the parties that were involved with the installation of the windows and was awarded an undisclosed sum in 1975 in a settlement. At that point, CNA hired an outside engineering firm to assess the overall problem. The engineers made a number of recommendations, including limiting how low the blinds could go so they wouldn't trap heat up against the glass. CNA lawyers stated that this is all that could be done without the tremendous expense of replacing every window in the building. CNA decided that it just wasn't worth it to replace all the windows at that time. Not lowering the blinds all the way and other small adjustments worked until the 1990s when the glass began cracking again. This starts to beg the question, what laws are in place to ensure buildings are kept up and don't pose undue risk to the public? Well, here in Chicago, building owners are required to file a report every two years, and it's a self-report. So basically, the building owner has someone walk around outside the building with a pair of binoculars, and then they sign something that says there aren't any problems. Anyway, back to the 1990s, when CNA windows were cracking again, 
and they hired another engineer. That engineer gave a list of options. You can either put a film over every single window, the film will hold the glass in place if it breaks, and then you'll have time to repair it, or you can replace all your windows with heat-treated glass. The price difference for the two fixes is what you'd expect. The film is cheaper than replacing all 2,900 windows, about 10 times less. And guess which option CNA chose? They were halfway through putting up the film and that mom was killed in October. The window that broke had the film applied. That's why it was able to stay in place for four whole months. It just wasn't repaired fast enough. The incident revealed a serious lapse of accountability on all sides. The city fined CNA $250,000 but that wasn't enough. In a civil suit brought on by the family of the mother, CNA agreed to an $18 million settlement. Also, they replaced all the windows. Every single building is a, a kind of prototype of sorts. Each one comes with its own set of physical, human, and financial variables that are being balanced against one another all the time. Today, much of the research and focus on keeping windows in their place has to do with the building's shape. Certain shapes and orientations can disrupt the patterns of wind, so they never build up to such intensities. This has to be done with simulators, and like wind tunnels or in software, that accounts for all the variables of its design and its surroundings. There's also local codes and laws to consider here. Responsibility for problems at the outset of a building are usually pretty easy to identify and attribute blame to people. Was it a problem in the design, or the product, or how it was installed? New York has Local Law 11, officially known as the Facade Inspection Safety Program, or FISP. The law requires the owners of buildings taller than six stories to have their facades inspected every five years and to repair any unsafe conditions that they find. The law was enacted in 1980 after Grace Gold was killed by a falling concrete block. It's also why there's semi-permanent scaffold on almost every sidewalk in the city. Because taking the scaffold down between every inspection is just too much work. In addition to being prototypes, buildings have a complex relationship to politics in the city at large. There are tons of laws that outline architect, engineer, and owner's responsibilities. But before incidents happen, it's often difficult to assess the risks that are associated with certain designs. But building owners and cities, they have a lot of responsibilities at a lot of different scales. And while laws can only do so much, that $18 million settlement has gone a long way to motivate them to make the right decisions here in Chicago but it's certainly a tragedy that it took so much to get here. Right there where I was sitting was the site where the architect Frank Lloyd Wright proposed a design for an absolutely insane tower called the Illinois. It would have extended an entire mile into the sky. The design called for 18 million square feet of workspace for 100,000 people. And in my next video, we'll explore the work of Frank Lloyd Wright and how he became the kind of person that could dream up such incredible structures. That video is available to watch right now on the streaming platform Nebula. Honestly, without Nebula support, I wouldn't be able to provide you with such consistent, high-quality content like this. It's a creator-owned platform for video and podcasts that offers an incredible value for you, the viewer, and the highly curated set of over 150 educational creators on it, like me. Sam at Wendover Productions, Real Engineering, Not Just Bikes, City Beautiful, and many more of the folks that you already watch are on there. Uh, Nebula will be able to gain access to our regular videos early, just like my Frank Lloyd Wright video, but there's also exclusive content that you won't find anywhere else. Sometimes when I get a tour of a place or interview someone especially interesting, I'll publish a separate video for folks that want to just dive in a little bit more. It's an entirely new video of mine with more of my reactions, coupled with insights from others that just didn't quite fit into the narrow framing of the YouTube video. So there's explorations like the extended tour that I got of a unit in Marina City, or the deep dive of the history of Bilbao, Spain, with my friend Iker Gill. Nebula's also just rolled out an entirely new layout, a brand new news section, and an exciting new lineup of Nebula originals, which accompany your favorites, like City Beautiful's deep dives into how each of the world's greatest cities came to be. But who knows, maybe I'll get to have an original on there soon too. You can gain access to this world of amazing content simply by clicking the link on the screen, and it's also listed at the top of the description. From there, you can sign up in whatever way you'd like, the most economical is to choose the option that's $2.50 per month when you sign up for a year. Or if you really value this channel and want to show your absolute maximum amount of support, you can choose the lifetime option. That's like the angel investor tier. Either way though, you'll unlock the entire catalog of treasures of your favorite YouTubers. All the while, you'll be directly supporting this channel to share my takes on the buildings that structure our world.
See you over there. And as always, thanks for watching.